the scriptures say to be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove that you might prove that you might prove it what the will of God is and I'm so grateful for what Jesus accomplished on the cross but there is work yet to be done and it's not a work that he can do he paid the price to make it available but he cannot force transformation upon you so there is work yet to be done and there was a price that he paid but there is also a price that we pay it's not the price of how much he loves us because he loves the world as much as he loves you but the world does not receive from him but the price that we pay is what do we love God how do we love God how do we let our lives show our love for God because worship is more than 30 minutes in a service and your lips moving back and forth worship is a heart motive worship is a life lived see and there can be worship with the mouth but insincerity in the heart because you don't actually love him like you're claiming to so it says be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what the will of God is to the degree that transformation takes place and to the degree that the will of God is manifested in your life is not matched up with his love for you, but it is matched up with your love for him. Because he will not force himself upon you, but he has taken the step to release everything that he is towards you in the cross. He made that first move. He opened the door, but you still have to come through it. And you still have to walk in more and more of Him. There is the work that He did, but there is the work that you do. And it is a life lived and worshipped. Not just singing of songs, but a change of heart that says, I love you, Father. And I want what you have more than I want what I want. I want to live for you. Those are the people that can go. They can go to heaven with their heads held high. Not that they accomplish something in their own strength, but they accomplish something in his strength because they loved him. And they overcame by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. This is available to every person. Every person. It is not reserved for preachers and for miracle workers and for evangelists it is for every person that names the name of Jesus so this is his call this is his question how far do you want to go many claim they want the will of God, but they don't make the decisions required to see the will of God. Many worship with the mouth, but their heart goes somewhere else after church. This is the question. Are, do you want fellowship with the one who made you? Do you want fellowship with the one who's <laughs> I mean, with your mind you can you attain to the answer yeah but your heart your heart has to be transformed father we want to love you with all the love we have we know your heart for us our heart is for you the same way yours is for us make our hearts like yours transform us to your will to your will to your will and we will be a people that says we proved the will of God in our generation. We proved the will of God in our generation. In Jesus' name. Praise you, Father. 
You know, the scriptures say he is no respecter of persons, right? He's no respecter of persons. What he's done for one, he would do for anyone. There's no need for jealousy among the body, right? Because he is the same God to all. He is the same Father to all. Sometimes you look at somebody else's life and you get jealous of the, the love that's being poured out on them. The question to ask is not, well, why does God love them more? <laughs> the question to ask is, what are they doing that I'm not? See, because the same love that he has for that person, he has for you. And the same things he's willing to do for anyone, he's willing to do for you. Amen. He is not a respecter of persons. Oh, I feel like we had church. Amen. <laughs> Good weekend. Amen. You know, church church is fun, I think. It's not a bore to me. As a kid, it was kind of a bore. <laughs> you can't really blame kids for being bored at church. <laughs> But I'm thankful. I'm thankful that he is patient, that he's long suffering. He's a good father. Because even though I have not always been faithful, he's always been faithful. Could you imagine if God reacted to us the same way we react to him? <laughs> Anybody ever had a, a fair weather friend? You know, somebody that liked you, and, but they only liked you for what you could do for them, right? And, and, you know, this isn't condemnation, but usually, usually, those are the kind of friends that God has. They love God because of what they can get from Him uh, and uh, what they can receive from Him. And usually they, they attempt to live their own life for a time or a season, but then when something happens, they, they turn to God for help, you know, and... Um, and then once that thing is solved or once they get the money they needed or, or once they get the solution or they've moved on or they got their feet back, they, they leave God again until the next time, you know. And that's just where they're walking. And, and you know God is faithful. Everybody say faithful. Do you know you can do that all your life. He's always going to have the door open for you, you know. You know, he is all-knowing. Uh, this is this is something where your carnal mind starts to it starts to glitch up when it tries to think about this that, you know the decisions you haven't made he knows and understands the decisions you haven't made and sees them ahead of time but do you know he still gives you this is what's amazing he still gives you the opportunity to make those decisions knowing full well what you'll do do you know he will come to somebody with the gospel a thousand times. A thousand times, knowing they'll reject it a thousand times. Could you imagine God saying, well, I'm not going to waste my time with that person because I know they're not going to receive from me, so why would I even bother? But then he'd violate who he is, right? Because who he is is love. He says, I am light. I am love. There is no shadow of turning with God. And the love that God has for you, he has for everybody. And Jesus said it this way. He says, doesn't, doesn't God send the same sun on the wicked and the just? Doesn't God send the same rain on the just and the unjust? See? And he was giving an, an instruction to the children of Israel. And more specifically, he was giving an instruction to the church, to the people that would follow him. If you want to be like your father, you're going to love with the same love that your father loves. And it's a love that's not dependent on how people treat you, see? Because other people don't get to decide who you are. And when you allow an offense to change how you treat someone, really what's happening there is you're allowing that person's behavior to control your behavior. You're allowing that person's uh, uh, carnality, that person's weakness to change how you address them 
But see, they don't have the control and the right to change who you are. Only you have that right. And if you have been born of your father, everybody here been born again, amen? If you have received Jesus Christ, you are like your father on the inside. But that, you know, that life that you've been given has to grow up, has to mature, has to transform. And the thing is, even though he did the work and he paid the price and he gave you the life on the inside of you, that spirit that's on the inside of you needs to be nurtured and grown up in him. Yes. And just like a seed that gets planted in the ground, the seed has to, the seed has to be watered, has to be nurtured, has to be tended, right? And this is what Jesus likens the word to. He says, so or so is the word. And he goes through all of these situations of what stops the word, the seed, from bearing fruit. And what are some of the examples that he gives, you know? Offenses. Come and steal. One of the first things that happens when somebody gets born again is the old life that they used to have comes and tries and offends them. And it says, you know, you're not really changed. You're not really different. You're, maybe you get born again out of a family that's not born again. They'll try and draw you back in, right? Or you get born again out of a life where you have friends that they party, they drink, they do drugs, they're doing... You know, or may, maybe they don't do any of those things, but it's a life lived for themselves, a selfish life. You know, you can look okay, but you worship the God of money. You worship all different things. You worship yourself, right? You live for yourself. You could care less about your brother, your sister, neighbor, whatever. Step on them as on your way to your best life now. <laughs> See, but if you, if you follow him and if you allow him to nurture the seed that's on the inside of you you're going to grow up into the image of who created you see and that seed that was planted on the inside of you is the very image and nature of God and this is not to say that you become God but you have that life that Jesus had that he gave to you and that life has to grow up and be nurtured. And see, Jesus said it this way. He says, the sower sows the word. But at the end of that parable, this is, it says that, and that immediately the enemy comes for what sake? To steal the word. To, to steal it. To, to take the power away from it. Because he's not really afraid. The devil isn't afraid of people. People in their own strength cannot do anything, necessarily. But if the word is sown and it bears fruit, that's what he's afraid of. Because people that are a, a bed, a seed bed for the truth, bear fruit that wreaks havoc on his kingdom. And when you allow the word to be sown in your life, see, it's in a natural parable, they, you know, one of the things that comes is birds, right? One of the things that comes is uh, other seeds, things that were already planted there that are growing up and grow up with the word, right? And then it says it chokes the word and makes it unfruitful. Everybody say unfruitful. See, if you have weeds that are competing with the same ground, it's going to steal the nutrients, it's going to steal the sunlight, it's going to steal everything from that to make the fruit, right? And so, the Word of God, the whole point of the Word of God is, is that it bears fruit in your life. Everybody say, my life. This doesn't, unfortunately, now, okay, how do I say that? There is some, you can benefit from, and this is the point, there is, you can benefit from the fruit on somebody else's tree, right? So if somebody's spending time with God, somebody is receiving from God, somebody is bearing the fruit of the truth in their heart and in their life, you, you can benefit from that person. And you can go over to their garden and you can say, I'd like some of that fruit. You know what? I'm going to take it. And that will benefit you. But it will never be exactly the same. And it will never be enough as the word bearing fruit in your own life. See, and the goal of ministry, it is not to always be running to someone who you can tell is receiving from God. It's, it's the goal of, of no, I said ministry, the goal of uh, Christianity is not always running to somebody who you can tell is receiving from God, but the goal of Christianity is to be somebody that is able to receive from God themselves. Right. See, and this does not elim eliminate pastors and teachers and evangelists and all those things, but I would say, and I would put a clause in there, that if pastors and teachers and evangelists 
are making you dependent on them, or if you find yourself in a place where you are dependent on them, then you are out of balance to some degree, at least in the long term. Maybe starting out, that's the, there's nothing wrong with that, okay? But God did not send his son, die for you, come in the place of a man, and eliminate a priesthood so that you could erect another priesthood in your heart and go to somebody else to receive answers from God. He came to be a father to you. A father to you. He is your father. See? And he wants the truth of the word of God to bear fruit in your life as much as anybody else's. The question is not whether or not the truth or the word is powerful. It is. The question is whether or not there are things in your life, the stones, the birds, the other seeds, the other plants that come in and choke the word out that is making it unfruitful. See, Because all of those things, the parable is the sower sows the word. Well, where, where is the word being sown? It's here, right? It is our duty and it is our job to, in Proverbs it says, keep your heart with all diligence. Now whose job is that? That's mine. That's yours. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And what that means is that issues, there is, that word issues is the same picture as a river. There is a flow of life, right? There is a river that's flowing out of your heart. And, and what I mean by that is there is things that govern how you think, things that govern how you react, things that govern how you live. You know, sometimes when I'm faced with a situation and I get overwhelmed and I don't see things right, like by the word of God, there's these little, I like to think of them as little programs that kick in, you know. These little programs kick in and, and start to govern how I behave and I start to get overwhelmed and I get frustrated and I get angry and I'm not seeing things, <coughs> excuse me, I'm not seeing things the way that God sees things. And those things come up and they try and govern how I see the situation, and it changes how I receive from God in that situation, see? And see, when it says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Your heart is the place where life issues out of it, see? Uh, what does it say? Jesus says it this way. He says, out of the abundance of, oh, I might not get it exactly right. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? Whatever is treasured up in your heart, it's going to come out of your, your mouth, see? So in your heart, all of these things are contained, whether you believe the word of God, whether you have faith, whether you are afraid. How many of you know the soul is a big place, right? The soul, and we know from scripture, and, and uh, we won't go to the verse today, but, but at Paul in one place, he says he prays that your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that you're, you're more than just a body, yes? You're more than just a soul. You're, you're a spirit. You're more than all of these things, okay? You're all of these things together. Now, the body is pretty easy to understand, even though it's a complicated machine. Everybody understands their body pretty well, right? The soul, I, the soul is as big as Texas. I mean, it's, it's huge. Do you know how many... Think of all the things and the choices that are contained in the soul. People you hang out with. Who do you hang out with? Why, why do you like them? Aspiration, dreams, hopes. Uh, what you love, what, what kind of food you eat. What, what kind of career are you going to take? All of these things. are con And, 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 and in, the, in Proverbs says, keep your heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. See, because on the inside of you determines the outflow of all of these issues, that you, how you respond to things. Oh, okay. Do you know somebody that is lazy, that uh, never applies themselves? Do you know it doesn't, it's not a matter of what career path they pick? They're still going to be lazy no matter what, right? And, and they can say, well, that just wasn't for me, that wasn't for me. And they go on to the next thing. They, do, they are the same person in the next job that they were in the last job. They don't like the same people in this job that they don't like in that last job. 
and they have trouble with people at work and they come in late and they say, well, this, this job just wasn't for me. It's not for me. And they go on to the next one. And you just keep playing that same cassette over and <laughs> over and over because the heart issues out the life, issues out the behaviors and the patterns and it reproduces who you are on the inside everywhere you go. And this is one of the, like I'm, you know, I love, I love people, amen? Or I'm endeavoring to love people. But, <laughs> but this is why for the vast, now I, I'm, I'm the first to tell you if a place is not preaching the truth of the word of God, leave. Leave a church that's not preaching the truth, amen? There's two ways not to preach the truth. There's preaching a lie, which is obvious. Sometimes it's more subtle, all right? And then there's another way to lie. It's by omission. Omission. Everybody say omission. You know, part of the reason why I don't really particularly care for the news is because they omit. They omit. They'll tell you things that they want to tell you. And they create a narrative of current events that portray their bias. But they omit. They omit. They keep things under wraps. They don't want broadcasted. People do it in the pulpit every day with this. Every day with this. And by omission of truth in the word of God, they keep people corralled in an area where they never really change. They believe nice things about Jesus. They're going to heaven. All of these things are fine. They, they have a relationship with God to some degree, but they never go outside of that boundary because the truth isn't preached by omission. Maybe they don't directly say, well, we, that is of the devil. Nobody says that anymore. <laughs> but they omit it because they don't believe it or they don't know what to do with it. So I'm the first to say if somebody's not teaching the truth, you can leave a church. But usually the reason why people leave churches is not because of the truth. The reason why people leave churches is because they're offendable. And they go and they say, well, this church is not for me. And then they go to the next church. And they find out that that church is not for them. And they repeat the cycle. And I, uh, one of the pastors that I greatly respect, he once said, he says, the problem with going to different churches is you're still there at that next church. <laughs> Everybody with me? The problem with switching a church is you're still the same person at that next church as you were the one before. <laughs> now, I'm not saying there's not abuse in church. Everybody hear the spirit of what I'm trying to say, all right? There's good reasons to leave churches. But... But if it's because you don't want to face yourself or you don't want to deal with, you know, there's people you don't like. Do you know what? The people that you don't like are not the people causing you to grow. <laughs> Does that make sense? Uh, no, I said that wrong. The people that you don't like are the people that are causing you to grow. And see, we like to surround ourselves with people that keep us comfortable, that don't ever question us. We just want a buffer of positive support. I'm so thankful for all the support that my friends give me. What you mean is you only want people that never question you. <laughs> right? Right? Anybody, ever, anybody with me here? God forbid we tell the truth. See, but if we're going to follow Jesus, he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. He's interested in transforming your heart to the truth. He's interested in that word bearing fruit. And see, so oftentimes we're trying to get God to change the external things. And God can change the external things. He can cherry pick circumstances. He can come riding in on his white stallion and give you $100 or $500 or whatever the need may be. But if he ever doesn't fix the heart, the root is going to produce that same problem again. Everybody with me? So we keep trying to get him, come fix this situation. Yeah, but what about the next time when you're not? Because we haven't addressed, it says in John, it says he, he, wants, your, uh, he wants you to prosper even as your soul prospers, right? So there is a prosperity you can receive that's not prosperous to your soul. And the soul is a big place. The soul is containing a lot of decisions and a lot of issues. And out of those issues of the heart, see, it's always, this place of your heart is always issuing decrees and verdicts and decisions. And it's how you live and it's how you govern your life. 
It what, it's what makes you who you are. And, and a better way of saying that, it doesn't make you who you are, but it makes what is seen of you. And it makes manifest everything that's in your heart. What you say, how you live, the decisions you make. And see, the whole point of putting the truth of the Word of God in your heart is to change you, not to change the circumstances around you. Right? Right? So if, those, if that word, if that truth bears fruit, and Jesus went on in that parable, he says, the sower sows the word, but some bear fruit 30, 60, and a hundredfold. Do you see the spectrum? It's not all or nothing. It's a spectrum. What allows some farmers to gain, gain harvests is bigger than others? You know? It's not just one thing or another. It's a spectrum. It's the care they put into it, the seed that they sow. It's the tending that they put into it. Is it good ground? You know, all of these things come into play, and you can sell your ground for a whole lot more than other ground because it's quality ground. And the question of the Word of God is not, is the Word good? The seed's always good. What kind of quality of ground are you? Are you getting rid of the stones, and are you getting rid of the, the other things that can crowd in and choke your life, right? <clears throat> you can be turning to... Um, Hmm. Yeah. Go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Now, everybody knows Hebrews 11, for the most part. Hebrews 11 begins by saying, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, right? So if I give, if God gives you a word, as he did with many of the people in the Old Testament, it requires them to believe that word to obtain the promise. Yes? <laughs> And so Hebrews 11, if you read Hebrews 11, it is a whole list, not a comprehensive list, but a list of people that walked in faith in the Old Testament, right? In fact, let's just read this part here before we go to Hebrews 12, because it's just really power powerful. Um, we'll start here in verse 30, and he's already gone through, ver he's gone through 29 verses of these people, and you can read it later. But look here at verse 30. He ends it by saying, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. Isn't that the truth? Because it definitely wasn't by their strength. <laughs> by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah and of David and of Samuel and of the prophets who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Now, you, the aliens there, you know, <laughs> this is independence there. <laughs> we're not talking about that kind of independence there. Flight, the aliens those outsiders that were trying to take over Israel, you know. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trials of cruel mockings, scourgings, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn asunder, tempted, slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. On, and all of these, having obtained a good through faith, received not the promise. God, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Now verse 12, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. 
See, that cloud of witnesses it's talking about there, it's talking about those people that walked in the faith of God and received those promises in the Old Testament. This is the cloud of witnesses, those people that changed their generation, that God gave them a promise and they stood on it and believed it and they did all of those mighty works that he just listed. They turned the, they turned the armies that would take them over away. They stopped the mouths of lions. I got a picture of Daniel in my room. I just, you know, faith in God. It's just, a, it's just a powerful picture. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Everybody say every weight. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, patience isn't a bad translation, but more specifically, that word is endurance. Everybody say endurance. Endurance implies a long time, right? It implies some foresight. It implies that we're in this for the long haul. I don't know whether you know it or not, but we've been building for the last couple of weeks where Jesus said, if any man count not the cost, see, if he's going to set out to build a tower and he doesn't count the cost before he sets out to build it, isn't everybody going to mock him? He's built the foundation. He's got half of it done. Could you imagine a project manager halfway building a tower and, and, and realizing halfway through, oh, I never set out to figure out if we had enough money to do this. Not a whole lot of foresight. Not a whole lot of endurance. Didn't count the costs. See. Jesus said it this way. Every person that begins to set their hands to the plow and then they turn around and walk back is of no use to the kingdom of God. Because if you're going to start this thing, you better finish it. If you're going to say, I have faith in God's promises, you better hold fast to receive his promises. If you're going to plant the truth of the word, you better tend that word, not let things crop up with it, steal from you, take the word away from you, because his love for you is not in question. What kind of ground for you is in question? What kind of ground are you is in question. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, who was the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, and now they look at this. This is the word that's talking about here. It's not patience is good, but endurance. Who endured, everybody say endured. Who endured the cross, despising the shame, sat down at the right hand of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. See, <clears throat> See for the Jew, and, and this is written to Jews, because many of them had received Jesus, but there was tremendous cultural and social and religious pressure on them to reject Jesus. And as a Jew, you know, if you've ever seen, what's the name of that movie? Fiddler on the Roof. Anybody ever seen Fiddler on the Roof? Boy, if you, you know, and the one girl in the end, he, she married outside of the Jewish faith. She married somebody that was not a Jew. That person was, you know, that girl. If I'm spoiling the movie for you, I'm sorry. It's been out for like 20 years, so <laughs> it's not my fault. <laughs> the one girl, she married outside of, of, of uh, not a Jew, okay? They be, they'll have a mock funeral for you. You're cut off from your inheritance. They don't say, they don't talk to you. You're dead to them. This is the kind of pressure. And this was the cultural and accepted pressure. This was, this was normal. This was right. This was by and far. This was the 99 that believed this. Those people are dead to us. This is the cultural pressure they felt for receiving Jesus. They got no inheritance. They had nothing in the flesh that they could turn back on. They couldn't see their family, their, their brothers, their sisters. And Jesus said it this way, I've not come to, set, I'm not come to bring peace on the earth. I've come to bring division and, and war. I'm, I'm going to set mothers against their daughters and fathers against their sons and everything. He says, I've, come to, I've not come to bring peace. Because the truth, everybody say the truth. 
the truth by its very nature is offensive and divisive. Because the truth, if you want to, if you're going to claim truth at all, and you, only you can answer the question, you know, do you believe in truth? <laughs> Who was it that said that? Um, <clears throat> Pilate asked Jesus, he said, what is truth? What is truth? He says, for this cause was I born. This is why I'm here, that I might give testimony to the truth. All those that hear the truth hear my voice. See, his word is truth. And his word will divide you from others that don't walk in the truth. It will, and this is, this is what's happening in our culture because our culture for a long time had a predisposed, hmm, what's the word? Truce with Christianity. It was a cultural truce that Christianity was generally accepted and okay. And now you have a culture that is increasingly negative on Christianity sees it as evil, and when we try and uphold the truth of the word of God, where we see standards held in the word of God, the culture doesn't have those standards anymore. The overwhelming pressure is to reject Christ. Maybe it's not overall rejecting Jesus, but you reject what he teaches, which is the same thing. You can deceive yourself if you want. If you reject what he teaches, what the scriptures teaches, then you are rejecting him. And he said, how can you, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things I say, right? You're gonna call me Jesus and this is what the world likes to do. They like to use Jesus as leverage for justifying whatever they wanna do, see? But if you want the truth, everybody say the truth. The truth is gonna divide. The truth is gonna separate you. The truth is gonna push you into places and it's gonna leave other things behind. See, and this is what the walk of the Spirit is about, that he is sent to lead you and guide you into all truth. So if you need, everybody agree they need leading and guiding into all truth? I do. So if he's going to lead you and guide you into all truth, do you know what that all, that sounds good, we love hearing that. Do you know what that means? He's leading you out of everything you currently do. <laughs> in, in other words, who you are right now is going to change. I don't watch the same TV shows I used to or the same amount of TV. If you're following Jesus, if you're actually following him, not claiming him, if you're following him, you are following him out of lies. You are following him out of the flesh. You're fo following him out of the world and you're following him into truth, into who you're supposed to be and not who you used to be. Because we like to say, well, he leads us and guides us into all truth, that's fine. Where is he leading you and guiding you to? And what is he leading you and guiding you out of? Because if you think you're going to be different this year than next year, then something in your life is going to be changed, removed, separated from, divided off of. Right? Right? <clears throat> Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so, doth so easily beset us. See? This is an endurance race, an endurance race. I was watching um, a documentary a couple years back. It's, uh, uh, and it's, they, this one documentary documents, they had time-lapse photography of plants, okay? And uh, you go out there and watch plants grow, you can't really see it, right? But they made it real dramatic, and they said the warfare of plants, you know? <laughs> it was warfare in there. And, and, but you, you don't think of it that way. But I watched this one time uh, where this tree had already grown. It was a big tree, strong tree, you know. Take a lot of power to get it down. And you saw this seed get planted right next to the tree. And it grew up right next to this tree. And what it was was kind of a, a, a parasitic vine. Okay, so that it grew up next to it. And you saw this little vine, like, stick claw. It looked like claws, like claws on a reptile or something, and this, this vine had claws that would nick this tree and climb it. And, and all the while, it's just, and, and this happens over the course of seasons and years and months, and you know, just day in, day out, day in, day out, little bit, little bit, little bit, little bit, growing a little bit, growing a little bit. So, but they sped it up and they put it in time lapse, so you saw it all at once in about a, a five-minute segment. Okay, and you watch this vine grow up, 
get up to the top of this tree, climbed the pre-existing structure that was already there, scaffolded it, used it as scaffolding. And then once it got to the top of the tree, it just blew up. And it covered the top of it with its own leaves. And it took it over. And it, you know, it, it stole all the light. And from that point, once it star- stole all the light, it just, you know, it just supercharged. It kept growing. It, the end result of that tree is death. Because it used that super, that, that structure that was already there, that big, strong, powerful tree, and that little vine came up, took it over, and stole all of the nutrients. And see, what we don't see in life when he says lay aside every weight, every sin that says so easily beset us. I always like to put it to you this way. Like, if the devil were come after church today, knock on your door, and he just comes and you hello, I'm the devil. You, you read about me in church today. You know, I, it's my job. This is what I come to do. You received some word. You, you received some truth, and, and I'm here to steal it. I'm, I'm here to take it away from you. So give it to me. Here I am. Give it to me. But no. <laughs> I recognize you. <laughs> Is that how he comes? That's not how he comes. He comes clothed in justification, he comes clothed in offense, he comes clothed in good ideas, alternatives. He comes clothed as subtle things, like a small weed. He's like, oh, what's that gonna do to me? Look at, look at you, I'm, I'm huge. You know how much praying I've been doing? You know how long I've been with the Lord? <laughs> look at you, 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 don't, you don't stand a chance. Day in, day out, little bit, little bit until he gets up to the top of where you are and he takes you over. <clears throat> How many of you know God has a plan for your life? Amen. You know, he, he knows exactly who you're supposed to be, what you're supposed to do. He has a calling for you. He knows, he knows exactly how you're designed and how your talents and abilities can be stewarded in a way that they create growth and not a stumbling block. He knows how to do that for you. And if you follow him, He'll grow you up to a place where he leads you into all truth, not just the truth concerning the word of God, but the truth concerning what your life's supposed to be. Because Paul said it this way, he says, every single person's supposed to be a part of the body, right? Somebody's an eye, somebody's an ear, somebody's a foot. You have a place in the body of Christ that you're called to fulfill. And, and you, only you can do that job. Nobody else can do that job, right? Now, you... You, you have a specific calling, a supply of the spirit that's supposed to be added to the church wherever you are. And it is a role that is necessary. You are necessary in the body. And if you grow up, what the word of God's supposed to do is grow you up into a place where you are producing 30, 60, and 100 fold. Where the word of God has come to full maturity in you and it's bearing fruit and that fruit is affecting the world. It's supplying to the church. Either directly you are taking the world for Jesus or indirectly you are a supply to the church and the church is taking the world for Jesus. Do you know in the scriptures there's people that are called to send and there's people that are called to go? There are people that are called and you can read about it. There's, there's places in the body of Christ where people are specifically called to use their gifts and money and business to send the people that are supposed to preach. See? Everybody is needed. Everybody is necessary. But that 30, 60, and 100 fold return, which is not about offering, but it is about, uh, it's a, that 30, 60, and 100 fold, it's about the produce of the fruit of the truth in your, in your life. See, what is somebody, if there's never any fruit produced in their walk, the truth may have taken root in their heart, but it If they don't ever produce any fruit, something along the way stole the life out of that plant. Something along the way did it. Whether it was family pressure, 
Maybe it was something else. Maybe they just got so caught up in other things. There were substitutes or alternatives for God's plan for their life that was given to them, and it was sowed next to the seed that was true, and it looked so close like the truth, and it grew up and they entertained it. Some of these things are less, you know, some of these things are just average things, you know, life things. You know, Jesus said it this way. He says, if any man come after me and does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. In one place, and he was, after that, he gave a parable and he, he listed these people that would not taste of the supper, not meaning they didn't, you know, weren't necessarily born again, but they didn't walk into the kingdom. They didn't receive the power of the kingdom. This is why I've, I've married a wife. The other one said, I bought a piece of ground. I have to take care of it. I got a yoke of oxen. I got to go prove them. These are, you know, so what? You know, you may come to church and you're a good person, but if the 90% of your life is spent on yourself in another area, something's blocking the sunlight that's supposed to be given to the fruit of the word of God, producing fruit in your life. I took a moment, and I didn't know if I'd use it, but it's flowing, okay? I, I took a moment here, and I made a list of some, not all. I, I know there's more than this of the things that have tried to be sown as substitutes, okay? And you know, a pastor that I, I, I greatly respect, he said it this way. He says, the best way to steal a man's vision, who's supposed to give you your vision? It's God. The truth, the calling, the position that you have in the body of Christ. The best way to steal a man's vision is to give him a second vision. Give him two. And you know the devil never has any shortage of visions for your life. He'll give you three, four. <clears throat> you can see this principle in the world as well. And I'm not advocating for any of these people, but the people that lead huge industries. Uh, I, I hesitate to name them by name because I don't want you to think I'm necessarily endorsing them. But there are people that lead huge industries and they have huge billion-dollar companies. Do you know that their whole entire life's pursuit is about those companies. They don't, they're not good golfers. They're not, they don't, you know, fix cars up on Sunday morning or Saturday morning. They're all about that business. Everything else is delegated. Do you think those people go mow their yard? <laughs> Everything they do is focused on that one thing. I have to accomplish this. Now they may do it for a selfish goal, all right? I even read, you know, some of the presidents and the, some of these CEOs, they come, they have a, they wear the same thing every day. They don't have a diverse wardrobe because they don't want to spend and they cannot afford to spend and it's not in their best interest to spend nor their company's best interest that they spend an hour, an hour and a half looking through their wardrobe every day. What am I going to wear? I wonder what's a good job. You know, oh, I haven't worn that today. They don't care about that. They care about making that company better. They care about making the country better or whatever. They're focused. Everybody say focused. See, and these little things that come in that steal the time, steal the life, steal the nutrients out of the, and for our purposes, if the word is going to bear 30, 60, and 100 fold, there's a focus. There is a, a death to self and a life to the truth that comes in your heart and your mind. A, a permanence that every waking moment, I've got to be about my father's business. See, this is, this is what happens to people that give themselves to the truth. <laughs> I listed some interests here, and any one of these things I'm about to name, people give their lives for, and I could give my life for. And I, through following him in these last seven years being here, I have had to go through all of these and say, no, 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 no. And I'll, some of these things will take me on They'll take me on a month, six weeks. Sometimes they only take me a week and I get, you know, my mind and my thoughts and my emotions, they go down this track of, this is my version of me. Now, some of you may feel like you're predisposed to one thing, like you're really good at something and not good at something else, all right? But, but my, I've, I've found mostly, mostly that whatever you give your thought and your mind and your meditation to, you tend to convince yourself you're good at that thing, Right? Or you tend to take to that thing. Anybody ever have seasons where they get really excited about something? You can go, go through your own life and your own history and make a list of all the, 
the, it's like a, a morgue of dreams, you know. I remember that phrase in my life where I spent three months on this and two months on that. And <laughs> I got friends that are always trying to give me new dreams. Here, why don't you try this? It's like, oh, thank you. <laughs> Throw that away. I'm not going to let that seed even get sown in my life because I don't got time for that, right? Here's, here's some of the interests that I've had to put down. And all of these things appeal to me. And I could, I could grow these trees up as large as I wanted to or as, long, as large as I want to. Um, some of them I'm kind of ashamed to mention. I mean, they're just kind of nerdy, okay? I, I'm sorry, I'm nerdy. Uh, <laughs> we'll start with some good, real, real estate, right? I, I'll, I've, I know what to do. I mean, I could, I've got plans. I got plans on plans on plans. I've, <laughs> I've read books, all right? I had to put it down because the Lord didn't tell me to do anything with that. All right. Uh, at one point, I wanted to be a pilot. Okay. How many hours do you think needs to go into that? How much money? How much pursuit? What do you think I got to give up in order to make that dream come true? Well, follow your dreams. My dreams change every year. How many dreams are you going to cycle through before you're tired? How much fruit of the word are you going to produce? Same. These are the things that, when it says lay aside every weight and sin, there are some sins that are sins and then there are some sins that are weights. <laughs> Wanted to uh, build things, engineering. Thought about starting my own business. I thought about programming, you know, like programming a computer, program an app. Thought about learning that. Dabbled with that. Looked into what it would take to learn programming play with that for a week, got put down. I've had m multiple ideas to start my own business, like a lawn business, do this, do that. Interests, I love mechanics. At one point, I, I have, I have a, a evidence of these dreams in my shop at home, if you want to come look. You know? <laughs> I bought a motorcycle thinking I'd fix it up. Right? I thought, oh, I'll really get into that. Uh, building computers, fishing, fly fishing, you know, at one point, and I still, you know, some of these things still appeal to me, but you have to put them in light of the truth of the word. What's, what is a value in your heart and your mind? Because it says in the scripture, be diligent. Be diligent with your heart, or out of it flow the issues of life. And see, who's going to come up to you and condemn you and say, look at you. you. You spent your whole life fly fishing. What a waste. Does anybody do that? See, but what, what are you called to do? What, what I could do that. I could, you know, fly fishing. Some people take that into profession and they take that into guiding and they take that into outdoorsmanship and you can make money doing that kind of thing. I could you know, be real successful. Uh, what I'm saying is whatever you give yourself to, you'll become. Just because you have a dream, just because you get excited and emotional about something, it doesn't mean it's the pursuit God has for you. And see, these are the things sometimes in our Christian walk, the self-willed, self-led life that bring us into dead-end roads. And we have to, we spend a year going down that track and then we go down to the next track and we fall susceptible to the same thing. But see, if you will go to Psalms, Psalms 1. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight. Everybody say delight. delight. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree. What have we been talking about here? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth fruit, bringeth forth fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he do, does, he does, shall prosper. Shall prosper.
if you will trust God with your growth and your development, he'll take care of your dreams. He'll take care of fulfilling your aspirations. Because I, I've listed maybe, I don't know, 20% of the things that I've had to deal with in the years that I've been here. Dreams that have come up and I've had to put them down. Ideas that are given to me. Thoughts that are given to me. Pursuits that are given to me. What if you did this? What if I did that? I've run down that track for a while. What keeps me on the straight? What keeps me following him? See, when you spend time with the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, he leads you and guides you into all truth. And he'll bring you into 30, 60, and 100 fold. And what you're called to do will be fruit of the tree that he is growing up on the inside of you. See? And what really, sometimes we don't trust that he's growing us into something. But if you follow him, he is growing and birthing and building that tower up to completion. He is growing that tree up to the place where there's 30, 60, and 100 fold. See? And all of these things, there might be things on here, and I know from words that I've received, that some of these things I've listed here, he might have me do, or there's some overlap. But see, those things that he's called me to do are supposed to be fruit on the tree, not the tree itself. Everybody with me? I said this last week, that... Um, no, I, I'm thankful, I'm thankful that I did not understand at a, young a, at a younger age, um, 18, 20 years old, that I was necessarily called to business. Um, in some ways, I, I had predisposed aspirations to it. I know there's part of that in my calling, and, and I keep trying, you know, in my soul, in my own will, in my own planning, I keep trying to produce that fruit, uh, fruit on my own. I keep trying to go do something with it. But the fruit of your calling, how that comes up and how that grows up, it's time spent in the soil. And the soil, see, if that seed comes from God, the nutrients you need to grow that seed up, spend time with him. Spend time worshiping him. Get to know him. Do you, you think the love of God is important to your walk? Yeah. It is. You need his love. You need to receive from him. Do you think the truth is important to your walk? You need to spend time in prayer. You need to read the word. See? Do you think joy and peace? What about peace in a business world? Peace important to your walk? How many business people, you know, just pull their hair out all day, work 80 hours a week because it's all on them? See, because what you can't, what you try to do in your own strength, he wants to be fruit of the relationship that you have. That what you're growing up together, some, someday he's going to come tap me on the shoulder. He says, it's time. It's time. See? And when he does that, there's going to be something on the inside of me that can handle, that can handle the weight, that can handle the truth, right? And it won't be a, a forced thing. It'll be a fruit that's produced. It'll be a fruit that's produced. Submit your dreams to him. Spend time with him and he will, he'll grow you up. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you. Would you just come play for a minute? Thank you. It's so easy to look at a, the natural situation and judge ourselves of what God can do with us. <laughs> how much money we have, how much time we have, what kind of education we have. You know, God, the Word of God is evidence that He'll use somebody that's just obedient, humble. He'll take a fisher, somebody that fishes. It's all they know how to do. They don't know the word. Use them to shake a nation. It's so easy to judge what God can use you for. Don't do that. 
If you want to judge something, if you want to be critical about something, be critical about how much time you're spending with him. How much do you love him? Ask yourself, how much do I really love God? Where does he fit on that totem pole of priorities? Is he a little bit below the car you're fixing up? Or is it, is it above the friends you spend time with? Where is he at? Because to the degree that you give yourself to the truth of the word is to the degree that you're going to produce the fruit of the word. There's no, he gives you that spectrum. It grew up a bit, but then it withered. It grew up a lot, but then other things crowded it out and took the fruit away. And then some produced fruit 30, 60. Some of them, that was the only thing they put in their garden. It was a hundredfold. What, what do you want? It's because it's not about how much he loves you. He loves everybody the same. How much of the love that you have for him is found in your heart? What you going to do? What you willing to give up? Let go of he said it, those who find their lives here are going to lose it. This life will come to an end if you believe it or not. If you lose your life for his sake, you'll find